with Stephanie McCarter in a conversation about her new translation of Ovid's Metamorphosis. And I'm sharing the screen at the moment. And what you're seeing is the publisher's blurb. And um, what I want to say, though, I haven't got much to say, but I am so excited. Uh, I would just like to say that to, to paraphrase um, David Daniel and the title of his paper about William Tyndale that I think he delivered in about 2005, without Ovid, no Shakespeare. OK, I'm just going to leave that there. And um, without Stephanie McCarter, to my knowledge, there would be no verse translation of Ovid's Metamorphosis by a woman in English, full stop. They haven't said that on the publisher's blurb. I mean, I know you've very rightly, I want to talk about your generosity to the, the, the kind of community that you come out of. And Mary Innes, of course, published her translation. But that is correct, isn't it? That you are the first woman in England. I mean, that is, I mean, mic drop moment. Um, and I mean, for, as someone who's thought about Ovid in English for over, over 30 years, that's me, um, and I'm not a classicist, everyone, and I'm sure we've got classicists in the audience. Stephanie is a classicist, but I don't come from it from a position of that knowledge. So the questions I ask will come from a very much a sort of English perspective. But I am thrilled to welcome Stephanie, if I may, to this evening's conversation. And the way we, we had a quick chat last week about this, and it is going to be quite an organic conversation. So I've got a question for Stephanie to kick us off in a moment that she's aware of, and hopefully we're going to talk for about 30 minutes. I've then invited Stephanie to read uh, a fragment, a section of her translation, and I asked her to choose a section that she felt hadn't received enough attention yet. Um, so we'll keep that under wraps for the moment, a big reveal, <laughs> 30 minutes. <laughs> And then hopefully there'll be enough time for Q&A. So I'm going to stop sharing the screen for a moment. Hopefully everybody's um, got the details there and the, the wonderful endorsement from Penguin. So the question that I want to ask you, just ask a simple question. What's the story behind your translation? Um, and, and you can take that up in whatever way you'd like to, because I think it's a really brilliant, a brilliant story. In, in all its forms. So. Well, thank you so much. This is this is really delightful. I'm so pleased to, to be here and having this conversation and so many people making time to come and listen. So I um, turned to translation for the initially in around 2016. Um, I had written a monograph on Horace that was published in 2015. I had um, two young kids at that time. And I remember sitting in my office in June of that summer. And I thought to myself, I don't want to write another word that I don't just really, really, really want to write because time became very sort of precious with so much going on in terms of kids and teaching. And um, and so it's sort of coming at this from a you know, having received tenure, and that's a very privileged position to be in. So I acknowledge that for a lot of contingent faculty, especially to take on a project like this is very difficult um, in terms of time and um, you know, having the freedom. But so I, I, I sitting in my office thought, what can I do that I think will help resolve some of the issues I see in classics, which is that we are a shrinking field and we are often perceived as a very exclusive field. So I wanted to devote myself to writing that was going to bring classics um, to broader audiences and that would seek to invite people in rather than shut people out. And so translation to me was really the best way to do that. I was also um, an English major and when I was growing up my my one ambition was to become an English teacher <laughs> and classics gradually <laughs> pulled me away from that and um and I really missed that a lot and so turning to you know iambic pentameter and thinking about you know English poetry and style it just was such a wonderful treat for me so I um I think after I had this sort of epiphany in my office that I needed to start translating. I sat down that day and started translating Horace. Um, and at the same time, I started writing um, essays that were meant to, or they were directed towards a um, non-specialist audience. And so I was publishing for uh, Literary Hub and Electric Literature and Eidolon when that was still publishing. And so I, um, around the same time, wrote an article 
for um, electric literature at the prodding of a student of mine about the, the story of Lukothui and how her rape had been really um, rewritten as consensual sex by a lot of the translators. And, you know, I think the combination of me working on Horace and me thinking critically about Ovidian translation caught the attention of, um, of Penguin and some people who were affiliated with, with Penguin. And so then they ended up reaching out to me. But um, I have to say, just being the being the kind of nerdy person that I am, I really just think writing an iambic pentameter is very fun. And so I had already started just in my spare time translating Ovid, not really knowing if it was going to go anywhere. But, um, you know, I wrote the essay about the Lukothui episode and I translated a little snippet into iambic pentameter. So I just kept translating that. I remember riding to the beach with my family, with my with my husband driving and me sitting in the passenger seat, translating um, into iambic pentameter. And I remember um, sneaking paper into the, our graduation ceremony here at Sewanee <laughs> and then doing little bits of translation while we were uh, going through the many, many, many um, format, formal aspects of the ceremony. And, you know, I just sort of tr started translating in all the corners of the day. So by the time Penguin got in touch, I had translated the Lukothui episode, the whole opening creation scene, and the Apollo and Daphne story. So I had those ready to go. Wow. I just, I'm, I, there's so much there from translating in iambic pentameters on scraps of paper. I'm not quite sure where to go. Somebody actually, I've just noticed um, that somebody in the chat function has just said that they're very excited to learn more about your translation practice. So I, that kind of segues into, this isn't where I thought we'd go now, but I think we will if that's okay. I mean, um, I don't, I'm not a translator, even though I I like writing about and theorising about translation and what people do with, with classical texts in English. But, you know, where do you start? And and if can you can you kind of do, can you identify a practice that you have? It just it kind of sounds amazingly um, prodigious and uh, exciting and something It's so antithetical to, to what I how I live. You know, I think the place I started was just having taught Ovid so many times, both in Latin and English. So I just always start whenever I approach a new line by thinking, what would I want my students to get from this line? Um, what would I want them to take out of this moment? And really trying to, to build that into the translation as much as possible. I mean, I would you know, to a degree, the iambic pentameter was the least, in, um, I mean, at first that was quite intimidating, but once you get into the mode of it, then you start just thinking in iambic pentameter <laughs> and um, speaking in iambic pentameter and recognizing it, seeing it in headlines. I mean, it just sort of becomes a part of your, you're just sort of steeped in, in it. Um, so yeah, it was, it, was, it was really about paying close attention to Ovid and building into the lines what I thought was important. And I worked on it full time. So I took, again, this is this is coming um, from a position of being quite privileged and having tenure. I took a year's sabbatical um, and we moved away because I needed to just get away and and get out of my normal routine entirely. We moved to Australia for a year where my husband is from and took the kids over and every day they went to school and um, and I translated Ovid from nine to five for for a year there and then four months back here and then we came back and I got I had to start teaching again but even for over a year after that I was working on it every day again in the corners of the day <laughs> right anytime I could um, I taught from the text as well um, because I can't escape from the classroom, even when I am on the other side of the planet, like I'm thinking about my students and how they're going to respond to the translation, how other um, people who are teaching it might want to use the translation. So I'm thinking about that a lot. Um, and so I taught it. It was really important to me to see how it taught. And then I spent a whole summer just 
um, trying to make it more concise and tightening and tightening it up. And that was full time for almost the whole summer um, in 2021. So, you yeah, know, it was just um, it was it was a lot of labor. <laughs> um, yes. I mean, what I'm hearing is passion. Yes. <laughs> passion. Um, familial commitment. And that's another yes. story, perhaps. But that's <laughs> I kind of have you like the I want to say the Von Trapp of I am a bit pentameter. I don't know. Did the whole family? I don't know. Did, did the family get involved in this or did they just say that's what Stephanie's doing? Well, my kids did get a little bit into this. And my son would ask me every day, like, you know, how many lines did you get through today, mom? Um, my husband is also a classicist. So he, oh. <laughs> which does help a lot. <laughs> so he, re he reads everything I write and okay. sometimes gives me the pushback I need very often. Um, so yeah, I mean, it did become a, a family ordeal, not ordeal, that's not the right word, oh, but a family. Oh, that's a giveaway. <laughs> <laughs> not an ordeal. It became a, a family, the whole family got involved. And yeah. I, you know, and I will say, I became a, a little bit obsessed with the, with the project. I mean, you can't give yourself to something like that full time and not get quite obsessed, but it got to the point where the line between me and this text started to blur. <laughs> and um, to a degree, I so much so that I will try not to let that happen again, because, um, you know, now it's to the point where I need to, I need to, you know, um, you know, criticism is very hard when you're so, when you're so connected yeah. to something, right? So it's, um, I don't know if I will ever be involved in as intense a translation project again. I may, but I need some time to recover. <laughs> The person, this is Suzanne, who's the, who's from Dublin in in the guest in in the chat function there. I think there's a practice there. <laughs> there's some really interesting practices. I might, yes, that's probably not what you have in, my, in mind. I mean, I could speak, I could speak more particularly about you know word choice and my translation strategies and goals. Will, yeah, yeah. Um, certainly. But that was, I mean, just when I think of the practice, it was, you know, I think of it as a, it was became a full time job. And not just something I could do sometimes. No, and what I've what I've taken from reading your introduction, which again does actually outline your practice in a in 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 a, in a very um, approachable, but I think expected way. And also, and I I didn't mean to sound rude with Stephanie, but when I was an undergraduate, I never read the sort of translators' notes, <laughs> but now I know that's where all the action happens. And so. Um, your your translator's notes kind of really give a very good kind of critical political perspective. I think it's very mm -hmm. self-reflective about what you're doing. But the thing I wanted to talk about, and this is where I thought we were going to start, or where I wanted to, was I'm struck by your 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 interest in community, really. And I mean, I think you've brought in your family in a way that I hadn't <laughs> expected, but that's another community. Um, in your introduction, you know, you are, your your practice of citationality is exemplary, I think, and um, you are incredibly, uh, a careful makes it sound like it's strategic, but it isn't, but it, I can, I think it's part of your practice that you want to recognise the, the women particularly who've mm -hmm. come before you and have worked with you. Um, is there anything you'd like to say at this point? Because then I want to segue into your students as well, because you've mentioned them, mm -hmm. but that's obviously another important community. Well, I will say that in my own a career, I've had so many amazing women as mentors. I, mean, I, I studied Ovid under the completely brilliant Sarah Myers, who wrote, a, 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 she's written wonderful books and commentaries on Ovid. So I mean, in terms of my own mentorship, the first Ovid translation I ever read was Mary Innes's, and yeah. I feel I feel very protective of her in a way because um, I feel that her translation came in the mid 1950s when yeah. you had Ralph Humphreys, you had um, you know uh, uh, Horace Gregory, you had several very kind of um, big name poets who were translating Ovid, and and I feel like her translation didn't get a kind of fair shake in comparison. I've gone back and looked at some of the reviews of that of, of Mary Ennis, and you know, there's one in Sewanee Review, which is you know here so uh, published here at Sewanee, yeah. and it was something like 13 pages long, and page after page devoted to the male translators, and one sentence or two sentences maybe assessing her translations. 
if you like Ovid in prose, you might also consider Marianus's translation. But um, yeah. but that was just that was standard practice um, at Penguin Classics that time was to translate into prose. So it wasn't her choice. Yeah. Yeah. And um, but I also think, you know, she really probably shaped the way Ovid was received for decades. And her accomplishment, I don't think, has ever been recognized. She doesn't have a Wikipedia page. And a lot of the other male translators do have a Wikipedia page, you know, for example. So, um, yeah, so I just wanted to sing her praises and acknowledge her a bit Quite in the introduction. Yeah. yeah, and I think, you know, for anybody who has been interested in, the, as I say, the cultural politics of translation, as I've been in the last two 20, 30 years, really, and just thinking, where are the women here? Uh, mm -hmm. Not with the Erodes, but with the metamorphosis. I think, that, you know, yeah. women's engagement with this poem is, is very different, isn't it, than, than the Erodes, for example. But just mm -hmm. Mary Innes is, you know, for me, until you came along, Stephanie, the sort of epitome <laughs> of thinking, where are all the women? And now you yeah. are my, you know, other <laughs> sort of icon. But it's, but I think you also mentioned other contemporary um writers don't even think as too mm -hmm. um scholars of color i think are in in, in your interest so all of this is, is there anything you'd like to comment about that because i know yeah. you're you're very interested quite rightly in the sort of sexual political dimension yeah. of Ovid's poem but there's also you've mentioned the word privilege quite a lot and you know mm -hmm. is there anything you'd like to gloss on that i don't know sure i mean i think that um what some of the people i see myself in conversation with the most are not just the sort of feminist classicists who've done so much. I can't, I can't stress enough how much women readers of Ovid have done to advance our understanding of this poem in the past yeah. several decades. But also, you know, people who are taking up this poem creatively, and yeah. they are giving us just such wonderful interpretations, new ways to think about this material. I'm thinking of Nina McLaughlin's wonderful book, Wake Siren, Paisley Rechtel, her great uh, book of poetry, Nightingale. Um, one of my favorite uh, artists is Elizabeth Columba, who's giving these wonderful re, um, sort of reimaginings of these stories, um, uh, centering women of color in them. Um, and and we, uh, I think you and I share a love for Portrait of a Lady on Fire, you know, Sonny yes, Shiyama's we reading of, of the Orpheus <laughs> myth. And, and so I learned, I feel like I've learned so much, you know, when I, when I, I remember when I was living in Australia and working on the translation, one night after my kids had gone to bed, I said to my husband, I'm just going to walk to the cinema down the street and go see this film. And, and I think that, you know, thinking about the way she reorients the gaze around the mutual gaze and, uh, you know, this sort of reci reciprocity that she builds into this myth really changed the way I was thinking when I was translating. And so I'm so indebted to these women who are who are reworking this material in interesting, illuminating ways. And I think exactly. And I think when I say women's engagement, I mean, women have worked, have, you know, since I've been working since the 16th century and before, you know, um, have been working with the poem, but not directly in translation because of its subject matter which yes. goes back to something you mentioned um about 20 minutes ago which about your students and and that discussion so i'd like to sort of go into that that kind of aspect of the translation because mm -hmm. i think it's really important where this translation has also come from which is the, the classroom yeah well you know when i initially started having conversations with my students about ovidian translation was when I was teaching a course on women and gender in the ancient world. And we uh, read the Leucothoe episode in um, it was Ralph Humphrey's translation. And um, and I asked my students, what has happened here? You know, uh, can can you ex explicate the passage? Um, what themes is this playing on? And and there was some confusion. And this was not because they were bad readers. They're, they were really talented readers. And um, and, and I and I came back to my office immediately and looked at the Latin and I thought, oh, well, the problem is it's not been translated as clearly as it should have been. So then I started looking at all of the other translations and 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 in some of them, it got really, really rewritten as almost a scene of titillating um um sex where she's you know she, uh, Lakothui is shuddering at his manhood you know these things that just are not in the latin so um so to me part of my engagement with this and my wanting to take this on was to create a text that but not just acknowledged the fact that there is sexual violence here but that made it really central 
and that um, tried to compel those reading it to ask the simple question, why is there so much sexual violence here? I mean, if you just open up and look at the table of contents, I use the word rape a lot. And I do that as a kind of, um, you know, putting a, a, a you know stake in the ground and saying, this is what these stories are about. And, um, and, and, you know, to me, it's such a central theme because it is, this is an epic that's so much about power and the way that power um, can change bodies, the bodies of others. And that's, that is what metamorphosis is. These, um, you know, these changes are often done at the hands of people in power and they're often very brutal and, um, and they're violent. And, and in fact, the word for rape that Ovid uses is violence. And so it's really wrapped up with um, the larger theme of violence and power. Um, and and I, I felt like if I tried to prettify the rapes, I am obscuring that theme. And so I really wanted to bring that out. But there was also the question, the way that this theme intersects with other aspects of Ovid, which is his interest in the body, which is in the second line of the poem. And, um, and, and, and the ways in which you know, the body, bodies and identities either coincide or don't. And this is a really complicated relationship that anybody has with their body. And that's something that Ovid is wanting to explore. I mean, um, so I'm thinking of Daphne and the way that she, what she wants is agency over her body. And so as a translator, I was really uh, aware that I needed to take great care with the way her body is described. Um, and and also not to just look at these bodies through the, the, the sort of heterosexual male gaze. Like I didn't want that to be the role that I put readers in because I feel like Ovid is really interested in exploring different modes of reading and different um, readers. So, you know, I, in looking at some of the translations, I was really taken aback when they would put adjectives in there <laughs> that weren't there in the Latin. And part of that was, I think they were trying to shoehorn Daphne into a, you know, modern idea of what a beautiful nymph would look like. And so she doesn't just have lips, she has teasingly tempting lips, for example. Um, women don't just get chests, they get breasts. And of course, that's important in this epic because chests are the seat of identity. And Ovid wants to explore the relationship between the ident identity and the body. And that relationship really resides in the chest. Mm. And so when Pygmalion is sort of sculpting the statue to life, he's doing that by, by touching her chest. But so many of the translators have him sort of fondle her breasts. And so mm -hmm. those were some of the re, you know, re-readings I was trying to, to do and to, and to bring out. And I think, you know, there's so many, I'm not a classicist as we know, and other people in the audience might be thinking, can you say more about the significance of the chest then? Is it, mm -hmm. is it a classical, I yeah. mean, yeah, can you could you explain that a bit more for me if 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 nobody else? <laughs> yeah, I mean it's it's a really wonderful um, notion. I mean it goes back to this ancient Greek idea of the thumos, um, and the thumos is like it's right here and it's where all of your emotions are. Okay. And even like Homeric warriors when they're about yeah. to go out onto the battlefield, they talk to their thumos. They're like, okay, thumos. <laughs> okay. And and so and um you know I'm just teaching a course on Lucretius and he locates the intellect everything kind of gets into the chest. And so we, we tend to think up here, but the, the ancients really put this yeah. there. Yeah. That's a mate. Thank you so much. <laughs> I've, I've just been, that's a revelation to me. I mean, I've worked on bodies and I teach theories of the body, but there are so many different theories yeah. of the body. That is really fascinating. And yeah. I think, again, going back to Suzanne's question about translation practice, that also glosses at quite a granular level <laughs> um, what has happened to this poem. In, in the hands of other cultures. You know, I'm not going right. to blame particular gender for it, but right. the culture, I think. Um, and just thinking about that. So we we teach a lot of um, the episodes in translation in various media here because we are a department of literature and creative writing. And John, who is in the background there, but he is kind of at the, in the vanguard foreground of critical creative practice. So um, my question is, um, we've had quite a lot of pushback from 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 students, you know, because of the material, because we we kind of introduce them to vignettes, episodes. Um, and quite often, so the Apollo and Daphne one, which has had a lot of reception, mm -hmm. hasn't it, in terms of different media, you know, in Western culture is a dis deeply disturbing 
um, yep. episode. And so content warnings. I mean, what, what, this is a, you know, if there mm. are any press in the in the audience, I'm sure there isn't, but you know, a huge, they seem to like this topic. I mean, <laughs> how, do you, how do you, I mean, I do think they're important for what, I don't mm. want to make tri uh, trivialize this at all, but when you teach the poem, how do you frame it um, mm. with your students? And that, I'm asking that in a genuine sort of question as right. a teacher, as a teacher with, who finds this important, right. but also wants to know how to handle it empathetically. Right. You know, I I, I do offer I offer content notes. Yeah. But to me, um, what I try to do is I, I worry that offering the note, we sometimes use it as a way of well, I've acknowledged it in this way, and so I don't have to acknowledge it yeah. elsewhere. So yeah, I think yeah. that what's even more important beyond the note is that you actually center some of the the, the difficult um, topics and themes in your teaching. Yeah. Um, because I think that for student, my students, and I've never had, I've never had students push back against me teaching this material. Yeah. And I think part of the reason is I try to say, well, we're going to learn that I think Ovid himself is critical of the violence, first of yes. all. Yeah. Um, and but we're going to learn how power and rape intersect with one another. We're going to learn about, um, you know, the way that objectifying somebody through looking at them as an object is um, is tied into rape culture. And so it's a way to, I think, give students vocabulary for thinking about sexual violence and for thinking about it really critically um, in a way that, you know, I think when you're reading a 2000 year old poem, it gives you a little bit of distance, right? So mm -hmm. it, it, it can be sometimes easier, I think, to, to talk about things through the lens of the past and then let students apply that to their own culture in time. Um, so I actually think that if you center the discussion around some of these more difficult aspects, um, students are going to react positively to the experience. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you so much. As I was saying, I think as well, I think it's all about the amount of time you have to, one has. You know, I think there's a big difference between sort of a freestanding lecture on a couple of couple of episodes from this right. amazing poem within a kind of survey course, right. maybe. I'm not saying, you know, that we should avoid it, but I think from hearing your description of what your practice is, maybe time and yeah. it's important too, as with everything. And that is something, of course, which everyone, that's what we need more of in all, right. everywhere, I think. So thank you for that answer. Yes. Um, I think, you know, I, I, I would like to turn, because I want to give enough time to bring our patient audience into the discussion. Um, hopefully we've given enough prompts. I just want to show, in case you haven't seen, this is it. This is this beautiful book, which isn't, I can see it's not coming across at all well, but it's just wonderful. I am so thrilled. I was reading it initially because it got published in America initially, didn't it? Yes, in November yeah. last year. So I was sort of reading it on an e-copy, which mm -hmm. is why I was, I think, so surprised and thrilled <laughs> when it, the hard copy. And it's out in paperback when? Sorry. Well, here in the U.S. No, that's okay. here in the U.S. It's <laughs> November fourteenth. So I'm not sure yeah. when it will would, will be yeah. in the U.K. I would imagine probably closer to a year from now. Yeah. So everybody, because it is it is quite expensive, isn't it? It, it is it. indeed. But, yeah. I mean, it is. You get for your. Let me just tell you, if you haven't seen it, you get a wonderful introduction. You also get brilliant notes and a glossary. So for those of us who are not classicists, I keep saying, and I have to say. Yeah, you mentioned the titles and um, just one quick question, which goes back to Suzanne's uh, question about practice. And you've mentioned this, I think, along the way. So I'm guessing that you started with the, Luc Luc I can't even say it, the episode, one episode. Right, Luc Othoui. Thank you very much. <laughs> and and then sort of it, it grew from there. So I'm not, it wasn't like a linear exercise. It became a linear exercise. Okay. Yeah. okay. So once once I got the contract and and okay. sat down, I thought, where do I start now? Well, I'll just keep going yeah. from the beginning. And I and I think those those of us who kind of know different iterations of the poem, I do think one of the great things you've done is it's I don't want to say separation because it's such an integrated poem. Did you spend ages thinking about the titles and how you what you're going to foreground? Yes. In, so in I, 
I did. I thought about the titles a lot. Now, one thing I did not do was decide that the stories would be as kind of broken up as they are on the page. That was part yeah. of that was Penguin's design. I mean, the title oh, okay. I can just hold this up. I mean, they get pretty big on the page, and yeah. that was that was Penguin's decision. Oh, and okay. and I, I quite like it though. I mean, I was yeah. speaking with someone not long ago who said. I'd never noticed the story of Pelops mourning for Niobe before because it was never kind of put yeah, exactly there. I think, <laughs> yeah. And I think because it's such a, an immense poem, you know, and even if you've been reading it in translation or for a long time, there's still obviously bits you go, oh, I never noticed that before. Yeah, and I exactly. think when you, you do such a lot in this translation, but one of the things you've done for me is given me another roadmap through right. and um, highlighted some aspects that I might have overlooked you know because of the big kind of you know spect spectacular episodes um, and I think at this point I'm going to turn to you because it seems the right time to bring in the section that you have never had the opportunity to talk about very much in, in all of your kind of public uh, facing work that you've been doing since you translated this so I'm going to turn it over to you then and uh, to yes. read some of your brief poem. Thank you so much um, so I would like to read a bit from one of my absolute favorite stories. This is not one of my favorite stories before I sort of got started on this. And I really only discovered that how beautiful this story was in the act of translating it. And it's now the story that I hold up as a foil to all of the really horrible um, scenes of sexual violence. Because for Ovid, that's only part of the story. Yeah. And that, um, and so I want to read a bit from Saix and Alcini. And what I love about this is the way they look at each other. And so, so many of the scenes of sexual violence just have one person looking at another in a very aggressive, objectifying way. So um, Saix has to go on a sea voyage. And, um, and this is leading up to the sea voyage. So I'll read this. Um, Meanwhile, his brother's miracle and others that followed trouble Saix in his heart. He means to go consult the god of Kleros, whose oracle consoles the human race. For wicked Forbus and the Phlegians made Delphi's temple inaccessible. But first he tells his plan to you, most faithful Alcyone. At once a chill shot through her bones. A pallor, just like boxwood, spread across her face as tears poured down her cheeks. Three times she tried to speak. Three times she wept. Through broken sobs, she dutifully lamented. Dearest, what have I done to change your mind? Where is the care you've always shown to me? Can you forsake Alcyone so calmly? Do journeys please you now? Am I now dearer to you and far away? Suppose you went by land. I'd only grieve, not fear. I'd worry, but not feel terror. It's the sea that scares me, the grim appearance of the deep. Just lately, I saw some fractured planks upon the shore, and often I've read names on empty graves. Don't let your mind be falsely confident, since Aeolus, your father-in-law, can find strong winds, and when he wishes, calms the sea. Once winds have been released and reached the deep, they are forbidden nothing, and each land, each sea is helpless. Striking heaven's clouds in their wild course, they shoot out bright red bolts. The more I know of them, and I do know them, when young I'd see them in my father's house, the more I fear them. If no prayers can sway you, dear husband, and you're too resolved to go, then take me too. We'll weather storms as one, and I'll fear only what I face myself. Together we will bear whatever happens while born together through the open sea. This tearful speech of Aeolus' daughter does move her starborn husband, for he burned no less than she. But he will not give up his planned sea trip, nor let Alcyone share in its risk. He tries at length to soothe her frightened heart, but does not win his case. He adds this solace, which alone can sway her. Though any wait will be too long, I swear on my own father's fires, if fate allows, I will return before the moon fills twice. Her hope is kindled by his sworn return. He orders that his ship be launched at once, equipped with all its gear. But when she saw this, a chill ran through her. A chill ran through Alcyone again, as if she knew the future. She shed tears most wretchedly, embracing him. At length, her sad mouth said goodbye, then she collapsed. Though Saix tries to stall, the young men seated in twin rows pull the oars to their stout chests as they cut through the sea with equal strokes. Alcyone lifts up her sobbing eyes and sees her husband standing on the stern, signaling with a wave. She signals back. As land recedes and her eye cannot spot his face, her vision trails his fleeing ship as long as possible. When this too fades from view, she gazes at the cells that flutter atop the mast. 
When she can't see the cells, she goes uneasy to their empty room and falls upon the bed. The room and bed evoke her missing half and rouse more tears. So. I mean, I, I, as you were reading that, there's so much that occurred to me. Um, Sharon, Sharon must have been fabulous in the, in the <laughs> and um, yeah, it, it isn't it is anti, it seems antithetical but as you're reading I think you, and it's about that problem of communication again isn't it that mm -hmm. for me it's, it's been such a such an important aspect of the poem and all the different ways that the poem thinks about communication um mm -hmm. which makes it sound really dull but the way you've rendered that and, and the story itself um what was it about this you said you you, you weren't quite struck by it until you start translating mm -hmm. what what drew you in? And we we already know that you became completely obsessed with poems, so that's all. <laughs> what was it about this particular? Thing? The way they look at each other, yeah. and and I I really read this um, episode in opposition with the Orpheus and Eurydice story, yeah. because um, you know she's looking at him; it's not his sort of backward gaze towards yeah. her. So we get to see it through her eyes. And then, so he, it's sad because he does go to sea and there's a storm and he dies, yeah. um, dies in a shipwreck. But then his body washes up. And as she, see, she stands on shore again and watches his body wash up. So that gaze is returned. And then what's so beautiful is that she jumps, she leaps out into the water. She transforms into a halcyon. She envelops him in her wings and he comes back to life. So she's actually the only person who successfully brings somebody back from the dead. And I th so I think Orpheus gets it wrong. You can't look back and have a one-sided gaze. The only thing that can do this is to look at each other mutually. And I just think it's really beautiful. <laughs> and also, it it does then help to address all of the asymmetrical power dynamics yes. that are that loom large. And I yeah. think I can, I can see that is amazing. And I'm going to pilfer that forever now <laughs> that looks like you okay. look at that somebody so I don't know if you can see the tap function but somebody just said in it that that just gave me chills it was oh. fabulous and I think you know I, I would do you do many readings of the poem so I have done a lot we have yeah. a, a group here in Sewanee called Swanee Spoken Word and they have put up with me for years now coming in to read my <laughs> poem <laughs> so um yes they've given me a lot of great feedback and just an opportunity to go in and see how it sounds in front of people which is so important. And do you write your do you write poetry, your own poetry? None that I would read in public. <laughs> okay, I'm not gonna go there. It's okay. I just I'm just fascinated because as I say that we oh hello, somebody's saying, would you release this as an audio book? It actually has been in the US, and I don't know what the plans are for releasing it as an audio book in the UK, but um um yeah, it was um it came out in December um for, on as an audiobook format here in the US. But I didn't read it. I did not oh, read it. No. I, um, oh goodness! Why am I? I can't remember her name. I really I'm sorry, you can Google this. That's okay. <laughs> Just so many names going around in my head right I now. I mean, she's my point phenomenal, is, though. <laughs> I think, though, I got to say, I think I'd like to hear you read it because I there is something. I don't know if you could, you know, if you feel the same way about the whole fifteen books. I don't know, but you, I can, you can hear your. Um, right. Oh, I do passion there's something ineffable about it so oh, that's yeah lovely. so Josie Fraser would love to be able to get the audiobook in the UK I should um, ask about that I wish I knew I'm so sorry yeah. we, were, was... we were pressed a penguin <laughs> yeah, that sounds good well that's you great. know what's so funny is that I mean obviously I have an American accent but I also have a southern accent um, because I'm from the south and so it was important that I got somebody who um had a little bit of my own accent yeah. because I kind of wrote this just like um when, for example like if you look at Emily Wilson's uh Odyssey she's writing obviously in a British accent and so yes. she says toward toward but here in the south we just say toward <laughs> so know, that goes back to Suzanne Suzanne this is a wonderfully protracted <laughs> answer isn't it to your question about practice I yeah. mean that is fascinating to me I would never have thought to ask that we even think it which is more about me but um, thank you so much. I'm so glad you did that. And I love the fact that the I can see people getting animated in the chat. So I think I'm going to now turn to our audit audience, really. You seem perfectly warmed up to me to, to ask and, and get involved in some questions. 
if you are if you are comfortable and you know that we're recording and you you want to um you want to uh be seen then please come on i've had i'm sick of my voice already <laughs> so um so i'm going to open it up now to questions and comments Oh, Jay, Jay, well, good etiquette, Jay. Hand is up. I'm terrible at actually reading them. Um, Jay, would you like to come online? Uh, yes, it's, if it's okay, I'll, I'll leave the camera off. Yeah, of course, of um, course. First of all, uh, Stephanie, um, I'm a fellow Tennessean. And oh, uh, my, in fact, I'm proud to say that my niece is uh, is in the English department there at your school right now. So, wow. um, <laughs> but uh, about a year ago, I moved to Turkey. I live in the Izmir area, and um, as one one hobby that we have in Tennessee that I love to do here is hiking. And um, I've just been amazed. I was I was out on a hike a few months ago and was chatting with this guy that I'd met, and uh, the topic of Narcissus came up. And he said, "Oh yeah, Narcissus. He's a local boy. You know, his spring. It, it's right over there." And I hiked over to a spring and saw a sign that said Narcissus. And I mean, I, I don't know how real the story is, but it's amazing living here in Ionia. Um, I've been to Colophon. Uh, yeah. It's a pile of rubble now, but that's where Arachne wove yep. her web. And there's yep. a hill near Izmir that has a weeping rock that they claim is Niobe's rock. Niobe, and so yep. I know that uh, Ovid wasn't, wasn't from um, Anatolia, but I'm just kind of wondering if you if you learned anything about how he compiled his stories and and where he got these these amazing I, I'll, I'm, I'm sure many of them are local but I'm wondering mm -hmm. if you could comment on that. Sure, I mean, um, one thing to keep in mind is that so many of the place you know so many places in um, modern day Turkey were actually Greek places, right? So you had a lot of Ionian Greeks who were living around the coast of of Turkey, what they called Asia Minor, and so you know we have. Herodotus, for example, was from this area. He was from Halicarnassus, which is there on the coast of Asia Minor. Um, and so a lot of the stories uh, are not surprisingly from there that the, that the Greeks get. Um, a lot of their mythology is from there. A lot of philosophy came from that area as well. So and one thing that Ovid does, if you, if you look at the whole trajectory of the poem, is he moves you gradually from around that area um, in Asia Minor, Turkey, uh, through to Greece and then to Rome. And so it kind of has this trajectory going that way. But at the same time that he pulls you towards Rome, he keeps pulling you back. And so just when you think you're getting into Rome, he's like, oh, by the way, now here's another Greek story. Uh, we we think that we are firmly sort of um, like the story of Pomona and Vertumnus, for example, which is a, um, a love, love story that takes place in Italy. Um, but it gives us a flashback to to Greece. So yes, we have that trajectory, but I think Ovid also resists it. Um, and you know, you you also have say the um, the Lakothoe story is told by one of the daughters of Minias, and they have a kind of fascination with the East uh, as well. So I mean, I think that the the East is an idea. Turkey, Asia Minor uh, did loom large in myth and in, in the imagination. I mean, certainly for Greeks having. Uh, celebrated their win over the Persian Empire too. They have a lot of um, a sort of associations in their myth with, with with that area of the world too. Okay, Brilliant. thanks Thank so much. You. Thank you for your question, Jay. And they're coming in thick and fast now. So um, Will McMorrin uh, is the next person who'd like to ask a question. Oh, well, hi, welcome. Hello. Hello there. Um, yeah, I was, I was, I, it's been a fascinating conversation. I was interested in what you were talking about. You talked about the metamorphosis of a poem that's, that's about the body. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking about what it was like translating it, you know, with that in mind. Yeah. I translated for Penguin, uh, Style 120 Days of Sodom, which is, you know, full of sexual violence. And mm -hmm. I found it quite a difficult visceral kind of experience yeah. uh, living with that violence over a long period of time. So I was wondering what it was like for you as a translator mm -hmm. uh, and were there times where, you, I mean, I, there were times where I just had to stop and play with the right. kids in the garden and stuff to have yeah. kind of antidote. But I was just wondering where, whether you felt the experience of translating it was a kind of embodied experience. That's a wonderful question. I mean, I think there's so many ways I could um, approach answering that. Certainly, I think the, the violence of the story, hmm, I, one way that I've thought about this is sometimes when you're dealing, I mean, I feel like 
Yes, I, ha I had to go pick up my kids at the end of the day and splash around in the water and, and just have fun with them. And it was a sort of antidote to the real intensity I felt. But there's a part of me almost that left my body during the process of translating. I don't know if I can, and that seems weird, but it, I became just so absorbed in it. So I just absorbed in the technical aspects and the meter and the reading that I you know, I was sitting sort of in silence every day and it just became a very cerebral um, um, activity. But part of that meant that because I was so absorbed in the technical aspects of translation, I was able in some way to distance myself a little bit from the violence, but it became a, um, you know, an act of engineering a translation. It was, I, I, I don't know, just that, that, exercise gave me a little bit of distance if I'm thinking of you know creating something formal and technical I, it, that helped me at least not get completely overwhelmed by the violence that I was translating if that make if that makes sense it does, yeah. yeah thank you very yeah. much great question thank you so much yeah. thank you and we have uh, the second question and I hope I'm going to pronounce your surname correctly Francesca Kubler um, I don't know if you want to come online or or type in the chat or just go on audio. You're very welcome to do whatever you'd like, how you'd like to ask a question. Hi. Uh, hi. Um, I just, um, it's quite a long winded question. I'm writing my master's dissertation actually about um, female translations of Ovid. Um, oh. I'm looking mainly at the Heroa days, but this has been really, really useful for me. Um, and I've also, I've read your essay, um, How Not to Translate the Female Body. Um, <laughs> And I'm really interested in the way you kind of interact with the female body and the violence um, mm -hmm. in the translation. And I was just wondering if you could speak a little bit more about translating sure. as a woman and translating the violence as a woman and how that might have had an impact on the way that you translate. Sure. I mean, I certainly think being someone who is, um, you know, a woman and in in the body that I associate with with myself is a as a woman is um I think it made me just simply pay more attention um, to the way that women's bodies are being described. And it also made me, I think, I don't see women as other, right? I mean, I think that's one thing to keep in mind because I am a woman. so to me, it doesn't evoke otherness to think of women's bodies. And um, so I can give you a concrete example of this. There is a, in book eight, one of my absolute favorite passages is the, um, when Ovid describes hunger personified. And, um, and he describes her in a way that to me evokes a kind of skeleton. And so he says that she has a pectus, which is a chest again, atop a spinal column. And so when I think of that, I think of, of her representing all humans' capacity to hunger, right? And so then she goes on to infect Erisichthon, who's a man, until he self-cannibalizes. Um, but when I looked at the other translators, they don't give her a chest atop a spinal column. They give her a spinal column with long dangling breasts off of it. Um, David, David Slavitt even says, you know, like purses empty and long forgotten, which is not in the Latin. So I think that there was this tendency to want to view that body as, as another, as, as a kind of other, and, and so distance the, the male reader from it a little bit. And, and I, I guess I think that just not, and also realizing that female bodies are not inherently sexual, <laughs> right? Um, and, or invitations. And so I think that just having that perspective helped. And so there was not to me the same temptation to, feel like I had to constantly modify body parts with adjectives that kind of turn the volume up on their sexuality. And, and so to me, I think it was very helpful that I have the relationship with, the, with my body that I had when I was, when I was translating. Great question. Um, is, yeah. Did you want to follow up there, Francesca, at all? Was that okay? Yeah, um, I also just kind of, um, you did talk about this a little bit in what you just said, um, but one thing that I've noticed in reading other translations is, like you said, all of this added language. Mm -hmm. um, and a particular example that really interests me is how you talk about um, Daphne and Apollo, um, and you say it's the attempted rape of Daphne. Yeah. Um, and yeah. something that I find 
uh, this is less a question really I suppose and more of just a comment but um, in a lot of translations that I've read at the end where the top of the tree sways a lot of people have tr I've yeah. noticed have translated that to say um, it nods as if in consent yeah. or something like that and yeah. to me that is disgusting like that yeah. makes me feel so uncomfortable um, yeah. and the way that you acknowledge the attempt that it's an attempt at a rape and mm -hmm. the tree kind of just swaying and not nodding yeah. I think is a really like yeah a really useful and a Thank really you. like new way of looking at it and I really really love that Thank you so much. I would love to talk about that for just a minute because it was so important to me not to suggest that she consents. I mean, there are I mean, there are translations that have her bowing a timid blessing on her lover's pleasure. I think that's Horace Gregory or that, you know, put the word yes in her mouth. And that's, of course, not there. But the main thing is I didn't want the tree to be a she. I wanted the tree to be an it because um, up until this moment, like the whole chase scene, Ovid has referred to her as Illa, like that girl, that girl, that girl, that girl. And in the moment that she's disappeared, she just becomes hike, uh, which is like this, this female object in front of Apollo. And so I just wanted us to be able to just, I don't want to know what Daphne's thinking in that moment. I only want to know what Apollo is seeing. Because to me, she wants the silence. She wants to be um, invisible to him. And so I think she needs to be invisible to us. And so there's a way that she can reclaim her agency through her inscrutability as an object. And so I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want her to be there. I don't want, I mean, if she's there, I don't want to suggest anything about her because only she knows what she's thinking and feeling in that moment. And it's important to me to keep her silent. And, and this is a weird moment where I think that she actually gets some agency through silence. So um, it was important to me for, for her to be it. <laughs> Yeah, thank you for that. And thank you for the follow up. And I know that we've got um, Fizar Shah, am I pronouncing that correctly? Um, he's been waiting patiently. So would you like to come on? Uh, I think it was important. I mean, I'm, I'm aware of the episode and I think there is an important difference, which I'm glad mm -hmm. we had an opportunity to discuss. So would you like to come on to ask your question? Uh, hi, Liz. Hi, Stephanie. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. This is so timely. This is wonderful. I just want you to keep talking. <laughs> right. So, um, Stephanie, I wonder if you can help me. So um, I've got a bit of Persian literature. Um, it's a historical event which is marked around the world in a certain community. And I want to bring it to the West because I think it's it, it's got a lot of universal themes. Now, my challenge is it's written by men for men about women. <laughs> right. right. So um, seeing it as a woman, I mean, I'll give you an example. Like one of the leading figures is a female and um, she's speaking like a man. And I hate that because I don't want her to speak like a man. I want her to speak like the empowered woman that she is, you know? So right. I'm rewriting that in a way that I would see it and how I would feel in that situation as a woman. Mm -hmm. But I need to make sure that the narrative isn't changed either. So how do you not get lost in translation? And how do you keep to the narrative, but also keep it correcting the, like if a woman wrote it at that time, how would it be? So I've got three mm. things here that I need to keep original, but not change it too much, but also bring it in a female voice as well. So what advice would you give me? <laughs> so you, you, are you, you're tra this is something that you're translating, is that yes, right? Yes, that's correct. Yeah. yeah. So from Persian to English. That's interesting. In, in the Persian, it seems the way a man would speak rather than the yes. way a woman would speak, yes. but you want yeah. to. Yeah. That's really fascinating. Like, I don't yeah. want to get lost in translation as well, because that's dangerous territory to go to. Yeah. And it, ru it ruins the material. But I yeah. see where a little flaw has happened because there are humans writing it. So, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. They, they've got their issues. <laughs> so I can see them. So, um, yeah, th that's the challenge. <laughs> I mean, that's I, mean I, I would love to, 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 to think of ways to do that, but without like a real familiarity with the text, it's going to be hard for me to come up with specifics. Uh -huh. But, um, but I, I, you know, I would love, I do like thinking about the fact that translation is, it's going to have to be a collaborative process, right, between the translator and the original author. I mean, if it weren't a collaborative process, then every translation of Ovid would come out looking the same, right? Um, I mean, my so much of this translation is predicated on my tastes 
affect um, my voice, who I am. So, I mean, I would just encourage you to to have confidence in, in, in inserting your voice in there because everybody does. And it's just acknowledging that part of translation is to is to find the voice for you as a translator to also be known. Um, I think that where we get into danger is like when translators think that they're being just totally objective and a total just a mouthpiece for the original. Because again, that's not possible. We all are reading these texts through the lens of our own experiences, our own tastes, our own ways of speaking. As I said, you know, you kind of have to read mine in a in an American accent, um, that kind of thing. So I mean, I just would say be confident in in making those yeah. choices and, and not not be so concerned about things getting lost in translation. Um, if, I think as long as you're aware of the problem, you're probably going to do this responsibly just because you're thinking about it. No, I think you know, it's exactly what I wanted to hear because, oh. you know, there was a creative process there and I, I don't think you should be scared of being creative. I mean, no. that's the point. I picked up the text to yeah. do it yeah. and, and that's what I should sort of go with like you have so it's very inspirational thank you stephanie oh, good. Oh, thank you wow oh and good luck with that that sounds like yeah, thank you what, thank you what's the text called what are you translating it, it's called karbala and um it's quite a big sort of event and uh women are he heroines in there but they're not really shown as the women that they should be <laughs> you right. know it's like men you know i'm like no i'm not having that <laughs> so i'm gonna More rewrite that <laughs> that sounds important thanks so much i mean again and that's a value added for this conversation for me tonight. Thank you so Thank much. You. Um, I mean, we've come round to the hour, um, which has been amazing. I don't know, it hasn't felt like an hour to me. Um, and that's thanks to you, Stephanie, your work, and I think such an engaged audience. It's such a. Um, uh, Francesca has another question. I think that's fine. Um, Francesca, would you like to come on um, before I wrap up? Oh, no, the time. Well, only because it's kind of, you know, getting on past my bedtime here. <laughs> so, and I'm a very old person. But again, it's important to have a conversation. Um, please do. Please do come in before I go into sort of my, you know, thank you, everybody. Yeah. Do come in. It's OK. Hi, I'm so sorry. I didn't realise that it had been an hour. No, it's OK. Um, I just wanted to to ask like I know it's a very broad question but a lot of people there's a lot of kind of scholarly debate that I've noticed about people describing Ovid as an early feminist mm -hmm. and I just wanted to ask you like with this text with other things that he's written like the Ars yeah. Amatoria what do you yeah. think of that? You know I is with the Ars Amatoria I think I think personally you have to realize it's a very different narrative voice um and so I have a I don't like so much to compare the Ovid of the Ars Amatoria with the Ovid of the uh, Metamorphoses. But I think that we can, in terms of the Metamorphoses and Ovid being described as a feminist, I actually love it because um, I don't think he's a feminist insofar as, you know, he would define himself that way or he would align himself with a modern feminist movement. I don't expect that of the past. But when I think of what for me, what feminism does is it gives women rich interior lives. It allows them to feel a range of emotions. It makes them complicated and messy and not overly simple moral agents, <laughs> right? And, and so it's recognizing the full humanity of women and, um, and giving that kind of equal play with the complexities of, of men. And um, and Ovid is so fabulous in the way he does that. He lets women be messy and do things wrong and voice their emotions and get mad and stick up for themselves. I mean, he does all of that, even as he's presenting us with horrible stories of women being objectified. Um, you know, he finds ways of showing how women will communicate with each other, even after trauma. They have languages all of their own. I don't know, to me, I mean, Ovid just has a fascinating way of looking at women. So even though I don't think he would call himself feminist, I think there's a reason why women are returning to this text again and again and again and finding it fruitful ground for exploring their own identities and their own um, times and places. And, and um, so you know, I'm, I'm okay with it. <laughs> it's a great thank question. You, I'm glad so you much. asked that, Francesca. Thank you so much. Um, we could, I mean, what, what's been a privilege for me, because um, obviously it's just a selfish thing I wanted to set up because I just wanted to chat with Stephanie, but what's been a real <laughs> privilege is um, learning so much from the questions that have been asked, you know, and um, yeah, and that's a thrill of, of doing this job, I think, and a real privilege. Um, 
I will wrap up now only because you need to go and have a life <laughs> <laughs> away from my but where somebody was supposed to be. Um, thank you ever so much, everybody. It's an amazing, I can't believe how many people have joined us to, to talk about Stephanie's translation and the process, really. Um, thank you so much.